an air conditioned refrigeration repairman or something that they can really get into. I've spent years in meditation. I've spent years in self-examination to know who I am. So when I take on a young man like the fellow I have now, it just turned 16, a Mexican student with so much talent, it's boggling. And I have to get him, he gets reactions. We laughed, we cried, well, good. Then we are touching the human spirit. We're touching the heart. We're touching the soul. I know how to do that as a performer and as a composer and to a degree I can communicate that if the goods are there but I think I mean my god Lenny and the, the children's concerts back in the 60s and 70s I hope the new guy coming to the fill will do that I think he might I think we've got a shot with that guy from LA my but dad that. My dad, Paris, was one of her oh yes yes he conducted the children's concerts at New York Philharmonic so I don't want to rant to Ray, but I think we have a responsibility to educate the young ones. Uh, with, it looks the like there's about to be a next. change over here, and we have to be done. But this was uh, informative for me and fruitful. I want to thank the panel <laughs> for coming. And thank you all for coming. Let's see. Come back around next year. Let's see where we're at. Let's see what happens.
Yes. That's why they're making good work. I know. I think about it. 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 I think Revamping this entire board. Someone asked me to revamp the board to class and stage. I say only if I can revamp it. Oh, because great. the purpose of the board is to support the artists and listen to what they say, not to be their boss. Yes, just raise thank money. you. Thank you. So I'm not going to do this shit unless you do it right. Yes. This is right. Oh, no, no, no. I'm going to raise money for theater too. So give me your card. Okay, okay. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. But I have to. I have to. I have to. I have to. Oh, 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 I could also pull mine from my email if that's easier to download it that way. Okay, I'm so order is the Ah, sorry. Seven places. Allison, I'm hoping we can check that our sound works before we go. That's uh, you'd have to do it right. That's what I mean. Yeah. That's why I'm hovering. Yep. <laughs> do we have a login? Please? No, I do not. Right. Emily. That's a whole Emily. Again, this is a or we can't get them. I'm acting like I'm an artist, so I can't even do it. I didn't realize that was going to send it to me. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't I couldn't um, believe I ran out of 50 cards. Well, that's not a bad thing. It's just, I just thought 50 cards would do the trick. I may be able to do it. They're just sending me a I'm just going to give you my number because we got to get, we have to get, and my email, okay? Yeah. When are you opening up again? No, I mean, the season. Oh, it's not going, Emily. Hold on. Go ahead. This is your last show of the season, right? Okay, okay, no, that's fine. That's, that's good. Excellent, and that's that's where my wheelhouse is. I need to test the sounds. You want to stand with me while I do that? I'm stressed. What are we trying to see? Yes, I need to test it and find out. Can I just test our sound while we've got it here? Scroll down? No, 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 no. Go down. It's where this one, the bridge. Where the bridge. Okay. Okay. Let me see the show. Let me talk to you tomorrow by email and all that. Great stuff. Okay. Yes. Get home safe. And I'll see you Saturday. Up, up, up. Okay, we're out of it. Great, that's fine. I think the high, can we put it as high as it goes? Great, put her up. <laughs> Great, it's a good play for a minute, so we want to make sure they really hear it. Okay, awesome. We can get out of ours now. Thank you so much. I so appreciate that. No problem. I'll be feeling good. Sure. Are you, okay. long, are you good? Allison, why don't you do the presentation over the top? Is that right? And 
I will go get a timer for you in the meantime. Are you all set on here? Uh, yes. Are you in thumb race? That's fine. That's fine. We'll just go with the first one for now. Yep. And then the end the presentation mode? Yes, that's fine. I just wanted to see where is... The thumb drive in to so the he, he's saying you already oh. did it, right? They're, they're open in uh, they're in PowerPoint here. Okay, that's fine. We'll figure it out. I can confer with them and that's fine. I will get you guys a timer Thank and, you. while you do that for the first. Ask her. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's not my token. <laughs> I don't know how to connect yours, I'm sorry. Hello? It's working? Here it is. Here it is. Here it is. Here it is. Yep. Is this plugged in? Because this is the back. Testing? Hello? From the other day. Oh. This is the. So this might go here. Yep. Try that. Yep. It worked? Yep. Look at that. Thank you. Hello? Hi, test. Oh, this is working. Yep, yep, yep. All right, yep. guys, we're going to get started. Hello, hello. Let's gather in. Hi, welcome to the Arts Pitch Contest. How are we doing? It's the end of day two. That is way more energy than I thought. I saw a lot of you at Jazzy's last night. I'm very proud of you. Yep. Um, yeah. <laughs> so first of all, thank you so much for coming to today's arts pitch contest. Um, my name is Sarah Feet. I am the director of marketing and communications with Midnight Oil Collective. Um, and I am also an artist myself. So I can tell you that what you are about to see today is very, very special. Artists are some of the most passionate creators out there, but um, we rarely get to pitch our work face to face. Most submission opportunities are uh, for plays, musicals, even sometimes TV nowadays are online and passion gets distilled when it passes from one side of a screen to another. At yesterday's keynote, our CEO, Francis Pollock, mentioned the importance of applying text mentality about innovation processes to foundling artistic works. John Keo, Jeffrey Brock, and that incredible jazz performance uh, showed us how, just like the great Bill Evans said, jazz is not a what, but a how. And so to bring it all full circle at the end of day two, you're going to see these principles in action. Today's creators have approached their work with an entrepreneurial mindset. I'm sure every person in this room has a great idea. But today, we encourage you to look at these works, not just for what they are, but how the creators are approaching their processes. Many of them have built their original intellectual property from the ground up the same way a software developer might build an app with basic coding, 
or an engineer might build a prototype. Others are not about one individual work, but about creating a platform to uplift and enhance the local ecosystems through validating creativity in all of its forms. Each project, like any business, is ready for investment. But it's a different kind of investment because it's going to the artists. We are treating them like CEOs, and we are treating them like project managers because they are. What you're about to see is the first step towards not just one artistic work, but a whole franchise that has endless potentials for returns, both socially and economically. Which is to say these projects can do a lot of good and make a lot of money. The two are not mutually exclusive. Each project, um, oh, and I know, I know, I just said franchise, and a lot of you probably cringed. Um, because we've come to associate the word franchise with um, some kind of IP that's been stripped of its humanity. It's the last Marvel movie that let you down. It's the news that Twilight is getting a TV show. It is the hungry merger of Warner Brothers and Discovery. And yes, kind of, but let's stop thinking about franchise like a dirty word and more of an opportunity. It's an opportunity for creators to dream bigger than they ever have to not assign them one type of media, but to allow them to grow with their IP. And artists rarely work alone, which means funding an artist is funding an ecosystem of creators, which means funding local economies that are rich in the intangible assets of creativity, but just don't have a pathway to profit yet. And you have already helped all of these artists. That's right, you are complicit and thank you because you have welcomed these artists into an innovation space. Before we get started, I would like to introduce our incredible panel of judges. Today, we are honored to be joined by Christy Lutz, founding partner of Kashif Incubator, Mara Manis, executive director of the New York State Council of the Arts, Rebecca Moore, program director of the Arts Council of Greater New Haven, Jason Price, co-founder of Next Haven and partner in Exaltair Capital Partners and Jose Torres, Entrepreneurial Fellow at SEAS, Sci City, and Joseph W. Williams, Jr., Director of NHG3 Operations, the Community Foundation of Greater New Haven. Each venture will pitch for five minutes. After that, our judges will have the opportunity to ask questions for two minutes. This time will go fast, and I will have to cut the creators off if they go over. But do keep in mind that these are also just the starts of the conversations. And we hope you will take time to connect with these amazing creators, entrepreneurs, and of course, our esteemed judges after the contest, perhaps after you make your way to the award ceremony at 5 p.m. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our first venture, 5015 Records, presented by uh, Maurice Harris. Oh, Maurice and Rod Harris, hi. <laughs> You're both here, welcome. Good afternoon, I'm Dr. Maurice Harris. Rod Harris, Jr. And uh, we're the co-founders of 5015 Records, which is duly based in Atlanta, Georgia, and New Haven, Connecticut. I've been a recording artist and audio producer since 1994. I've earned several gold and multi-platinum records. I've studied engineering and electronic media and hold degrees in business and leadership. And for the past three years, I've been the director of marketing and communications at the Schwarzman Center, a center for university life and the arts right here at Yale. And I'm a Grammy-nominated guitar jazz guitarist with degrees in music and in business. I've spent the past 15 years of my career on stages, in studios, and in movies with the likes of Queen Latifah, Beyonce, and Music Soul Child, to name a few, while leading my own touring jazz trio and quartet of my own. It's impractical in the age of streaming music for an indie label to sustain itself releasing records alone. There has to be a something more that makes the company viable, something that a label can do that an artist can't do themselves, and something that responds to a growing appetite among audiences for immersive experiences. 
That something more from 5015 is virtual reality, which we see as a multimedia franchise opportunity. We produce albums in tandem with art exhibitions and live performances that can be presented not only on streaming platforms and galleries and in theaters, but also distributed as VR content. The VR market is expanding. VR appeals to people's desire for immersive experiences. VR also appeals to people's desire to connect and socialize through technology. This trend in how people want to experience the arts and engage with each other, combined with continued growth in the music market, creates a perfect environment for our venture into VR. At 5015, we do more than just sign recording artists and release music. We also partner with visual artists, performing artists, and VR developers to produce immersive music-based experiences that can be enjoyed in real life and in VR. We call these experiences excitals. And here's how it works. We sign musical artists and facilitate the production of their single EP or album. We pair the musical artists with artists in other disciplines to develop an immersive experience, an excital. And uh, then we, um, and the Excital, of course, is driven by the musical work. And then we transform this real life Excital into a VR experience that can be downloaded from 5015's Excital Marketplace, an interactive gallery. Best of all, every time your favorite 5015 artist releases new VR content, you can go back to the app and expand your gallery as easily as making an in app purchase. Excitals are our most powerful vertical in our revenue mix, especially when combined with live performances and art fairs, which are both means of presenting new works as well as inspiring new collaborations. Up to this point, we've talked about our concept, the Excital. Now let's talk about our proof of concept, time check, what we've done. At the beginning of this presentation, I mentioned that I'm a recording artist. In the fall of 2021, I began my third solo album, Fracture. I commissioned a group of visual artists known as the Collective New Haven to develop a photography exhibition that would tell the story of the album. When the album was released in September 2022, 5015 hosted the first in a series of events known as the Fracture Excital. The Fracture Excital is an exhibition of photography by the Collective NHV with a recital of songs from the album by me and an optional artist to talk back. The um, photos that you're seeing here are from the first excital held at Next Haven. And uh, the news article you see here is a review of the Fracture Excital from an event that I did at Toad's Place in March. And uh, that's one of many articles about the work. I most recently presented the Fracture Excital in two performances in the Westville Art Walk just a few weeks ago. But wait, there's more. <laughs> We collaborated with a VR developer to turn the Fracture Excital into a VR app, which is now available in Meta's Oculus App Lab. In this VR Excital, guests can explore the music, visuals, and contemplations either on their own or with up to 20 participants speaking and interacting in real time from around the globe. And this is only the beginning. While our proof of concept was in development, we've also begun building our roster of musical artists and have already begun conceptualizing the next two Excitals. As you might imagine, our go-to-market strategy extends beyond music lovers, VR enthusiasts, and art enthusiasts to include teachers and educators as we look to exploit the educational benefits of experiencing the arts in conversation with students across the globe. And although our proof of concept is currently only uh, available on Meta's Oculus platform, our next phase of development is a proprietary platform dedicated exclusively to 5015 Records, records Excitals. So gets us, this gets us to the opportunity. We're open to partners, investors, or a combination of the two to build the VR platform that will take our excital concept to the next level. Thank you. We welcome your questions. The entire value chain, so from owning the IP with the artist, the actual um, IP for the app, and then eventually um, the platform, that, that's a lot. And then if that is the case, have you made progress on all, what? I know you made progress on the, uh, on the IP and also on the new platform. Uh, 
Yes and yes. And this is a conversation that we have with the, for example, um, with the visual and performing artists that, that we collaborate with. So the work that we did, for example, with the, uh, with the Collective New Haven to, to this point, um, we would think of it as, uh, we would think of the original commission as a buyout, but we have been in conversation with them, for example, around royalties on the works in the, in the um, monetized app version of this. So we're thinking about this as an opportunity not just for the recording artists, but also for the visual artists and the collaborators. And um, you know, when we talk about franchise opportunities, we're talking about the opportunity for this work to be exploited in so many different ways. It's not just the album, it's also a VR experience. It's also, so um, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah. Hi, my name is Danessa Pedroso. I'm a ceramicist. Um, I wanted to ask, what are the opportunities that you have for visual artists um, to partner with you and, yeah, continue this work? Great, I'll take this one because we're thinking right now about, I mentioned in the, uh, Rod mentioned in the presentation that there are a couple of other excitals in progress. Rod, as well as being co-president, is an artist himself. And so um, I know Rod puts on his curatorial hat around my work and sometimes I put my curatorial hat on around Rod's work. And so in fact, we've been in conversation with um, at least one local artist. I won't name the local artist uh, just yet, but is not only a, a painter, but a sculptor. So hearing you say that you're a ceramicist really sort of piques my interest. We like to think about things like Culinary, uh, culinary arts, fashion, like uh, what, what are all the various ways that we, can, you know, that we can iterate and collaborate with artists and then how do we meet the challenge of translating that into the VR world? Right. Yeah. Great. All right, thank you guys so much for your pitch. 5015, Maurice Harris and Rod Harris Jr. <laughs> Next up, we have the Sirena Project which will be presented by Ashley James and Jesse Rasmussen and Elizabeth Thinkova. Oh my gosh, everyone's here. <laughs> Hello, that works. Oh, I don't wanna see that. <laughs> You want to click? No, you click. You want me to click? Yep, I'll click them. Thank you. Yes. Ooh, I love that excitement. Um, are you ready? It it's going, so we should go. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Dinkova. I'm Jesse Rasmussen. And I'm Ashley James, and we are the co-creators for The Serena Project. The Serena is a narrative film that follows a mermaid that washes up on an unnamed shore and is soon detained in a refugee, refugee detention center. About a year ago, this one here called me, and she said, I'm writing a movie with my dear friend Jesse, and I want you to produce it. It's about a mermaid, and we're not exactly sure where it's going to go, but she ends up in a detention center. And like I say most times when she calls me, I was like, hell yes, I'll do it. Um, and that began a journey that started us off on this process that really encompasses what we now like to call the Serena Project that we're going to tell you about. And initially, the provocation with which Jesse and I began in our graduate school days at the Yale School of Drama, we realized we were both fascinated by mermaids and sirens because they're a symbol that exists across cultures. Most known cultures have some version of a hybrid human oceanic creature. And in the time when we were feeling especially powerless as immigrants with noticing the very flawed and horrible responses that my country, Bulgaria, Jesse's country, Australia, our country, the United States had in response to the refugee crisis happening all over, we were really yearning for the power of the voice the power of the siren song to express something that shares in our joint humanity and that welcomes strangers as a part of our community. So we asked ourselves, what is a contemporary situation in which women wash up on unknown shores without any connection to their past or present, but yearning for community? And the answer to us was obvious. And then the question became, how do we do this ethically? I'm going to try this. Yes. So our story, the story of our feature film, um, is this one. This is our contemporary mermaid fable. Drawn by the sounds of a sinking vessel carrying refugees in a storm, Serena, a woman from the sea, rescues a drowning woman and they wash up on the shore of an unnamed coast. 
the survivors are immediately detained and imprisoned in a women's refugee, refugee detention center. As other detainees are attract, attracted and repulsed by Serena and her mysterious nature, the power of her presence and her voice slowly infiltrates the center and the urge for an uprising builds. So this surreal psychological drama is a love story ultimately and at its heart for our world which is so divided and chaotic. Uh, it's a testament to people's ability to connect across life experiences, languages and cultures. So this is our contemporary fable. We wanted to approach this story by introducing a surreal and mythological element to a really present social issue in order to short circuit people's defenses and really let them see what it means to be another and to be yearning for community in a new way. And we also connected this to a flaw in the industry that we are all familiar with. In theater and film, there are many examples of misrepresentation and exploitation in narratives, especially ones that feature vulnerable or marginalized communities. So we were yearning to create a model in which the benefits, the profits that come from this film and other intellectual property are fed back directly into those communities whose stories are being told with them as co-creators and partners. So in response to that, we started to assemble a team that we are only three out of at this point, probably 60 <laughs> overall. Uh, and we believe that a team that is multicultural and multinational is the best antidote against tyranny, against hopelessness, for hope in arts, but also really good for business because <laughs> you have all these connections in different countries and places. So the four pillars of our model that we are really putting into action are community, working in partnership with asylum seekers as story consultants who are compensated, credited, and recognized for their work, as well as refugee service agencies. Transparency, we're having open conversations and recording the entirety of our process, so there is nothing that gets covered up and that process is exportable. Uh, equity, which uh, means that we are sharing profits with everybody who has participated in our process mm -hmm. and ultimately leading to uh, this sense of community that is larger and includes a built-in audience. Yes, and that's three seconds left, so I'm going to take us to our last slide. We need you to join our team. We're still looking for a lot of people um, to make this project see it to its fullest potential. Thank Ooh. you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Sirena team. In the interest of time, we're going to limit our questions just to the judges. So do any of the judges have a question for the Sirena team? Hi. Um, is it an animation project or a live action project? It is a live action project currently, but one of our values is also scalability. So at this point, we've realized that because of the interest that we found that we hope it can exist as a theater piece, potentially, as a live action film, as well as a documentary that really showcases the stories and the real experiences that have helped us build the narrative. Ah, okay, so that was going to be my second question. Is the multi So the multimedia part means all, all of those things you just said? Yes, cool. franchising. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I just want to pen to that, uh, to that question. So the multimedia part is is one product or has so different dimensions? Yeah. I'll jump in on that. So it started off as a, a live action narrative film, but through our process, which had a documentary approach, we realized that there were so many avenues where people, I mean, it's really like sprouted like wildflower over the last year that we've been working on it because so many people are eager to tell their stories and we have backgrounds in theater and film. So a part of our kind of, ethical co-creation approach was to get actors in a room who have these experiences and start telling those stories. And we found that it actually lended itself to all these other mediums really naturally. So it's kind of opened up. So how can we continue to develop this script and do it in the right way, which takes time, but also build trust, but continuing to create projects and kind of connect with different communities and getting things out there while we're still focusing on the narrative project as well, the narrative film. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Sirena team. All right, thank you. Next up, we have um, an on-screen feature. Uh, we are going to hear from Alan Keller and Walking Time Bomb. This is just Ford. 
This which one? Yep, yeah, that's Borg. And she said. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Allison. So just this button is for mm -hmm. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Alan Keller. I'm the writer-producer of the film Walking Time Bomb. Walking Time Bomb is a dark comedy about the sole survivor of a mass shooting who loses everything when the tragedy doesn't impact his life as profoundly as people think it should. But on a broader level, Walking Time Bomb is about the creeping normalization of gun violence in America. For example, instead of being horrified and outraged by a mass shooting in their own backyard, the characters in, the, in, in uh, Walking Time Bomb treat it with nothing more than morbid curiosity and are far more interested in exaggerating their own connection to the tragedy than they are in delving with the problem itself. Oh, now I'm way ahead of myself. Anyways. Um, so Walking Time Bomb is, I had this phenomenon happen to myself in 2014. The general manager of the place I was working was brutally murdered along with his wife. And the next day, everybody tried to make the story about themselves. That's one of the reasons why I wrote Walking Time Bomb, this trivialization of tragedy. And it's why I took on such a controversial topic as gun violence in America. But if you're an investor, controversy can be good news because controversy will draw attention to your project. Um, but cast is what's going to drive people to the theaters. And that's why we're looking at some really high level talent to, for the lead in Walking Time Bomb. Guys like this, of this caliber, right? <laughs> so what am I, nuts? Do I, why do I think I can get these guys in my little film? Well, I did it before. Everyone on this page has actually been attached to Walking Time Bomb at one time or another. Not only that, Netflix has actually optioned the script not once, but twice. So why has there been so much interest in Walking Time Bomb? That's because of the third and most important C of all. <laughs> all right, let, you know, the script's really good, but don't. <laughs> but I'm the writer. So let's hear what Ty, let's see what Ty Burrell from Modern Family said about the script after reading it. I mean, actors really like this script because they like scripts like this that are original, groundbreaking, they have juicy roles in it that they can really sink their teeth into, right? But, um, and also critics like that kind of film. And it has actors actually dreaming of that. It's be okay, and speaking of Oscars, a film nominated last year had a trajectory we think Walking Time Bomb can follow. Banshees of Inisher, in my favorite movie last year, had a great script, great actors, and, um, role uh, and scenes that were really memorable. People couldn't forget about them. In fact, a lot the Brendan Gleeson cutting off his fingers, um, that made a lot of people happy on the internet. That's all free viral publicity there. We think Walking Time Bomb could have the same kind of social media impact. Not only that, as the host of my own podcast, Too Much Effing Perspective, I plan on promoting my movie to my audience, whether they like it or not. <laughs> so in conclusion, Walking Time Bomb is ready to go in production right now, even in Connecticut. Um, we are uh, unimpacted by the writer's strike. All we need is your financial support. We have a go-to-market strategy to get the movie made, released, and uh, earning money back for investors as soon as possible. We have the full support of the Midnight Oil Collective, which we love. Uh, we have a go-to we have, a, we have a, um, a detailed budget, and we also have a great team in place that actually already has worked together to do a um, proof of concept short called Another Moment in America. It's in the screening room right now. I highly suggest you take a look at it. But, but overall, the most important thing Walking Time Mom has is the script. So please, I got a card here. It's got a QR code in the back. It'll leave you to the website where you can download the script and all the information you need to know to be the match that lights the fuse of Walking Time Bomb. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you, Alan. Alan, if you don't mind sticking around for a Q and A, Alan. Oh, Q and A. Yeah. <laughs> I was <know>. done. <laughs> there was a mic drop. Yeah. It was a very quality pitch, but uh, do our judges have questions? Yeah. 
Thank you. Um, you said you had a audience already with your podcast. Can you tell us who your target audience is and roughly how many numbers you have thus far? That is a painful question. We're Sorry. just starting, but we're getting, we have very big actors and talent. We've had uh, musicians like um, Slater Kinney, the Pixies, Styx, Morrissey's people. We have Julie Bowen's been on the podcast. Um, we've been growing exponentially in the last couple months. Um, I think our last downloads were like 10,000 for the last episode. Great pitch. Thank you. What comes after Walking Time Bone? Well, obviously, it's, 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 it's a certain, it's like Schindler's List. You can't have an actually sequel to this, you know. But it's, um, it's, we, I have a production company, Film Phobia, with 20 features under, under our belt and about 10 to 15 pilots already written. All right, next up, switching gears, we have New Belay, uh, which will be presented by Kevin Newberry and Donna Di Novelli. Just wait for us, the slides to come up. It's okay. Hi, everybody. Great, and I advance with that one. Yes, the big one. Great. Hi, my name is Donna Di Novelli, and I was born and raised in New London, Connecticut, <laughs> submarine capital of the world. <laughs> and that environment and those people, the shipbuilders, the teachers, the nuns, the cooks, the boys with fast cars, the rebellious Catholic schoolgirls, the sailors, the lifeguards of that coastal town have given me narrative after narrative, which I have turned into opera, music theater, film, and now an episodic TV series, Nubile. I've been waiting all my life to tell this story, my mother's story. <laughs> Keep going. The story of a teenage immigrant who traveled across the Atlantic from southern Italy with travel papers pinned to her dress, labeling her nubile, which then became a justification for an arranged marriage to a much older man. In seven days, we will be filming uh, uh, with the backing and funding of Midnight Oil Collective, we will be filming the proof of concept short film in which that teenage girl hides out in a dark church in the middle of the night to escape her abductor, only to find there is another teenage immigrant, also betrothed to an older man, already in the church, the Madonna. I've made three short films in New London the first, Stag, was my father's story. And I want to take a moment now to talk about collaboration. You'd be very lucky to find one or two collaborators in your career who truly get you, who understand the beauty beneath the pain, the complexities between the simple acts, and who brings out the best of your story, and with whom you can share a belly laugh. When I first told Kevin Newberry, my dear friend and collaborator, how, when my father was dying, he gave to me his most prized possession, a cookie tin filled with his collection of 1950 black and white stag films. Kevin told me I had to turn that story into a movie. I wrote my first screenplay in January, and we made that movie in July, of that year in New London, starring Sarah Steele and screening at film festivals around the world. 
When Donna first sent me her full-length screenplay for Nubile, I became immediately obsessed with the magic realism at the core of this relationship between a teenage girl and the Madonna. I told Donna, this is a brilliant film, but it would be an even more compelling multi-year, multi-generational episodic TV series. Within a month, Donna came back to me with a fully fleshed out pilot and a detailed outline for five seasons. This TV show will be both intimate and epic and even operatic. Honestly, we could, start the shooting the, we could start shooting the pilot next week. What we are shooting next week is the 10 minute proof of concept. Shooting in New London exemplifies the marriage of art making and community building. We have secur secured the most extraordinary location, the historic Pequot Chapel with its original Tiffany stained glass windows and a 1929 Ford Roadster, all for free. We have assembled an incredible production team, including our longtime director of photography, James Daniel, who's also the head of media at Global Citizen, and superstar designer, Matty Ulrich. Our designer features a duo of rising stars, including actress and TikTok influencer, Sarah James, and multi-hyphenate performer, Fina Straza. Fina made her Broadway debut as the youngest actor to perform the title role in Matilda the Musical, and was also chosen by Mariah Carey to star in the Hallmark Channel's A Christmas Melody. And what's good enough for Mariah Carey is good enough for us. <laughs> And this is just the beginning. We see New Ballet running internationally for several seasons, creating its own franchise and bringing a full-scale television production to Connecticut with occasional trips to Naples. We hope you'll join us make this possible. And we all know that there have been quite a few stories of Italian-American immigrant experience from a male point of view. And they have done quite well, actually. <laughs> but this is the first time we are showing a film from the from the female point of view, what it was like for an Italian-American woman without a gun in her pocket. <laughs> and one final word. Uh, okay, okay. Although this is billed as a pitch competition, in reality, when one succeeds, the right. we all succeed. And Midnight Oil Collective has, has created a new way for artists to come together in a collective, what, sharing resources and equity. So here's to all those who are pitching today. It's an honor to be in your company. Thank you so much. Kevin and Donna, thank you for that um, beautiful pitch. I'd like to pass it over to our judges. Do you have any questions for uh, the Kevin and Donna team? <laughs> One, is there any other cost that associated with the first pilot? And then talking about the series, if you can elaborate a little bit more about the series and cost, timeline, things of that nature. Okay. You're going to talk about the cost. And I'm going to talk about the <laughs> what the series is. Um, it really follows this woman who ends up being kidnapped, her first child at 16. And then she has three more sons. It becomes an intergen intergenerational series because by the time she's 40, she has another child. She's in the hospital. She looks at that baby, looks between her legs, sees it's a girl and screams, what am I going to do with another girl? Because she's the girl and she had, you know, all of this trauma, right? So it does follow a kind of intergenerational um, timeline. Um, yeah, and uh, so this uh, this first proof of concept costs uh, thirty thousand dollars from Midnight Oil, and we imagine the pilot uh, to be approximately a million, depending on how many times we go to Naples, you know, and how much we stay in New London. Uh, primarily shot in New London and in the area around. So, uh, and then we hope to have the pilot finished to sell to networks and streamers by uh, mid-year next year, and we'll be bringing our proof of concept as well as our early films to show people. Uh, to hopefully get some network buy-in. But we are ready to go, and the script is written, and we're happy to share it with people. Thank you so much, Kevin and Donna and New Ballet. All right, we are going to get our next one set up. I'm just going to confirm what that is. All right, we are now going to hear from Wine Down, Connecticut. Presented by Thema Graves and Lauren Jefferson. Hey, let me find some mics for you. Thank you. Sure.
Hello, everyone. My name is Lauren Jefferson. I am co-creator of Wind Down CT. I'm also a DJ and a digital marketing extraordinaire. <laughs> and my name is Tama Graves. I'm also co-creator of Wind Down CT. I am an event coordinator as well as a healing, a holistic healing artist. So speaking of health, America's got a problem, y'all. A recent study conducted by Cigna found that over half of Americans are experiencing loneliness and isolation, especially due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The study found that underrepresented racial groups tended to be lonelier than their counterparts. Another phenomenon that we have going on post-COVID-19 pandemic is a theme, and it's in direct response to the isolation of quarantine. I don't know if y'all heard, but we outside. <laughs> and because of this, the event industry is growing faster than ever before. Seeing this as event creators, we saw the opportunity to create an immersive experience-based event unlike anything we've experienced as native New Haveners, something that's more than just a party. So who are we? We're Wind Down CT. <laughs> we offer entertainment, community, and connection. And the magic behind this is that we incorporate decor, art, live music, DJs, dancing, custom-made photo ops, which you see here, food, vendors, and of course, wine. <laughs> An event that excites all the senses. This is our business model. Wine Now CT is the hub. We pick a venue. We have our own decor and production team. We pick entertainers, local vendors. Then we market our events. We sell tickets. We pay the venue, the artists, and the staff. And this is where we put money right back into the community and back into Connecticut's ecosystem. The remaining profits go back to the Wine Down CT Hub, and we use those funds to fund the next event. We're currently getting funding for Wine Down through our ticket sales, grant funding, and sponsorships. So our audience is basically black indigenous people of color, professionals, ages 25 to 44, in the Connecticut and surrounding areas with a median income of 40K to 80K. And we pride ourselves in being an inclusive space for people of all gender expressions, LGBTQ+, folks of color, and allies. And our audience and customers reflect this. Our marketing strategy is what has helped Wind Down CT grow so fast. Our first event had only less than 100 guests. And within less than two years, we've reached 500 guests per event. Our strategy is FOMO, fear of missing out. <laughs> we have an in-house marketing team which, who, runs, who run ads, and we have a self-generated database with over 25,000 people, over 8,000 followers on our Instagram. So in order for people to, to be a part of Wind Down, they have to sign up. And when they sign up, they get uh, updates with our secret dates and secret locations for every single pop-up event. With every event, we create hysteria with our marketing, and people want to be there. Every event we've done so far has sold out. And this are, these are some of the members of our beautiful team. And it's a local ecosystem of creatives and entrepreneurs. We have ourselves. We have Justin Hernandez. We have Travis Carbonella. We have our amazing decor team, Jessica Bach and Angel Cologne, as well as beautiful members of our community that represent businesses and organizations who help us with needs like promotion or setting up. These are our financial projections and our current numbers. The franchise business model is the model that will help us to reach our goal. Franchising our brand out first across Connecticut, then across the US, and then across the globe. Some of our competitors are some people you might have heard of, events such as Afropunk, Everyday People, and R&B Only, just to name a few. Our current status, currently we're selling out venue spaces with capacity of 500. Within the next year, our goal is to reach 1,500. And within the next three years, our goal is to reach 5,000. This would put our net ticket earnings at $3 million a year. Right now, we're looking for strategic partnerships, investments, and grant funding to continue to create our arts and culture vision in Connecticut first, and then also to give us the resources to expand the vision worldwide. And I'd like to end and conclude with a quote that was um, that 
is from Aslan Magazine, uh, a magazine out of Hartford, and an article written about us. Feeding a society deprived of interpersonal engagement from the pandemic, this gathering provides a much needed sense of belonging. Freedom and carefree connection is the common ground the dance floor is built on. We are wind down CT. Thank you. Pass it over to our judges. Any questions? Yeah, sure. Um, clearly not for me, since I'm older than the 44 uh, tar tar target demographic. But I get it. You don't look it. But, no, but, but, I, but I do. But I do, I do get it. I do get it. I do get it. So my first question is: um, one, who is the management team? Is it the two of you? Yes. Yes. Okay. And then uh, two, how much money are you raising, and what is it used for? Uh, so. Currently, we're just looking really for strategic partnership. Uh, we do have funding, which is great, but um, basically strategic partnership, someone who can either be a part of the event and, and has a brand that wants to align with our, our, our event. Um, oh, what is the money used for? Oh, the money goes into the event. So when it comes to paying, like paying our, our staff. staff, paying entertainers, entertainers are not cheap. Dating decor. <laughs> Getting venues, all those things. I just want to pen to that and ask, um, so is it uh, currently a self-sustaining venture or would it be without your grant funding? Like, It is currently self-sustaining, yes. But that only with your contributed income, with your with, grants? With ticket right? sales and grant funding. Um, yes. But in order for us to grow, we, we are asking for funding in order for us to actually reach the 5,000 mark. <laughs> That's our goal. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Wind Down CT. That's amazing. Oh my goodness. I was getting FOMO just looking at those pictures of everybody having fun. Um, next up, if you have an upcycled business card in your pocket, you have already heard of them. Uh, we are going to present um, all together now, presented by Sunny Alice. Thank you. All right. Oh yeah, one second. How's everyone doing? Art. <laughs> okay, thanks. All right, hi everyone. My name is Sunny. Uh, I use they, them pronouns, and I'm the creator of a multimedia inclusive kids television show called All Together Now. As an artist, I'm passionate about engaging young people's voices and visions. So they feel empowered as change makers, transforming themselves and the world around them. Now more than ever, we need stories that cultivate connection and belonging so people of all genders and abilities can live freely. And as an artist who works with recycled materials, I feel passionately about exploring creative ways to transform trash into something beautiful and hopeful amidst our climate crises. All Together now shows a diverse community of gender expansive people and their allies living authentic, joyful lives. This is a show about a neighborhood of people who share their stories, skills, and resources with each other to create projects out of recycled materials that uplift their community, empowering kids to imagine and build the world they want to live in. The main character of the show is 10-year-old Frankie, a non-binary kid who guides the audience through their neighborhood and each episode's theme. All Together Now builds upon shows like Sesame Street, Mr. Rogers, and Pee Wee's Playhouse, and will include both animated and live action segments, as well as stories from real kids. What sets this apart? This show can have huge social, economic, and artistic impacts. It could be groundbreaking, life-saving, and nothing quite like it exists yet. The project is in a position to partner with schools, nonprofits, and other organizations to build powerful allyships while finding the right distribution hub. As a multimedia show with different segments, All Together Now can be a platform to feature a wide range of artistic, innovative voices. And All Together Now has the potential to become a multimedia franchise. 
use that word. <clears throat> Revenue streams for Altogether Now can include a TV show, books, merchandise, educational materials, play spaces, and interactive events, to name a few. So far, I've released an inclusive children's book based on the world of Altogether Now. I developed a pilot script through the Midnight Oil Collective's incubation program. Big shout out to MOC. Uh, the show's proof of concept is playing in the screening room. Please go check it out. And I'm currently in conversations about partnerships with LGBTQ environmental and youth organizations, as well as producers, with the goal of producing a season's worth of episodes. A comparable show to All Together Now is Sesame Street. All Together Now is similar to Sesame Street in its mission to cultivate empathy and learning through an inclusive multimedia storytelling, but it uses a more gender expansive lens. I'm developing All Together Now with an amazing team of creative people, including colleagues from NYU and CalArts, as well as people who live locally. It's truly been a community-based project, and the making of it has been deeply aligned with the show's mission and values. I'm actively looking right now to connect with partners, investors, and producers to create a season of episodes. If you're interested in being part of this positive, groundbreaking show with social, economic, and artistic returns, I would love to connect with you. Thank you for listening, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. All right, I'm going to hand it over to our judges for uh, Q&A. Does anybody have any questions for Sunny? Yeah, well, I just did the uh, seed funding, uh, 30 grand with Midnight Oil to do the proof of concept. Uh, the next round could also come through Midnight Oil, uh, around 200,000 to make a pilot episode. But I'm looking in general to partner with investors and producers to do a full season. So... Uh, Ideally, a full season would be around like $2 million. Yeah. Oh, I wanted to know where you see the ideal home for the show. Yeah. You know, it's a little complicated amidst the writer's strike right now and amidst um, wanting to create like um, a gender expansive show. So that is something that I'm experimenting with, thinking about the difference between like a platform, a streaming platform, or like trying to build it more independently and put it online uh, and build an audience and traction that way. But I'm exploring both. I'm talking with a few different queer producers who have had work on Amazon and stuff like that. So both avenues, basically. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. All right. If there are no further questions, thank you so much, Sunny. Thank you. And all together now. If you, like I, were doubled over with laughter at the Arts Showcase last night, you're already a little familiar with this work. Uh, our next presenter is um, Marilla Martin-Cook, um, who is presenting Friend Animals. Hi, everyone. You've made it this far. Um, I am excited to be with you today, and I just want to take a moment to thank the other presenters as well. This has been incredibly exciting. There is so much positive energy and creativity in this room. Thank you for the support that we are all giving each other. Um, despite their identical holy gowns, three friends harbor secret rebellious dreams. I'm Marilla Martin-Cook, and I'm a playwright. When I'm not writing, I'm teaching classical theater to middle and high school students across Manhattan with Classic Stage Company. My play, Friend Animals, which some of you saw last night, is a play about choice. It centers the perspectives of three young women coming of age in a society dominated by a belief system that celebrates wealth, heteronormativity, virginity, and compliance. The society they live in is called America. Their belief system is called the bread narrative. What is a story? A story is a narrative, story, or tale. Any account of a series of related events or experiences, whether non-fictional or fictional. But who decides how these events are related? 
who decides whether they're true or false. Stories contain ideas. An idea is a thought or suggestion as to a possible course of action, an aim or purpose. In theater, we say character is action. We are what we do. Who is writing the stories that drive our lives? I spent six years at a Catholic girls' school, and the year before that at a co-educational Episcopalian church, and honestly, I had a great time. I'm not here to say I had a bad time. I had a wonderful time, um, especially at Lorena, which you can see in the top left corner, all those smiling young women. Um, and Lorena means the queen, as in the queen of heaven, as in the Virgin Mary, as in the mother of God. Um, and for six years, we celebrated her incredible yes to an immaculate conception and virgin birth, and we called ourselves Lorena Girls. Yet when I graduated from high school and entered the rest of the world, I noticed something. My yes was assumed, if it was requested at all. Nearly 20 years post high school, I've had time to reflect and also see the ways in which our society has and has not evolved. And perhaps some of this is because we are living our lives according to some very old stories. What we consume, whether it be bread, or a series of ideas affects us. It affects our self-confidence, our self-image, and our self-determination. That's why in a country like America, where the very first amendment is dedicated to free speech, people still spend so much energy trying to influence the ideas we consume. School districts control our curricula, social media licenses out our attention to the highest bidder, and in theater, it's no different. But if the arts have no value, why are we banning stories? The conditions seem ripe for an American version of the angry young men movement that transformed the post-war British theater. Now, as a woman, I have been socialized to hide my anger, but I will tell you that it fuels me. Misogyny bothers me. <laughs> Sexism bothers me. Stereotypes that restrict um, women to two archetypes, the virgin and the whore, bother me. I am upset on a personal level, but I'm also angry at a societal level. The world has been around for 4.5 billion years, yet we continue to perpetuate the same old problems, and it starts with the stories. Who's telling them? Even the ones we pay attention to today. Less than 20% of Broadway productions in 2019 were written by women. What's even more disheartening is that in 2010, when I conducted a study in Los Angeles to determine the percentage of plays written or co-written co by women over the 10 years prior, that number was no higher. 20%, if we're lucky. Yet, the majority of Broadway audiences are female. Women drive the majority of all consumer purchasing decisions across all sectors. So if we want to change the world, we have to change how we treat, how we value women's stories. We have to listen to women, believe women, program women's work. When I was in college, I studied acting like many of my colleagues in theater. And even at as progressive an institution as UC Berkeley, we noticed we were typecast into two types of roles, the virgin and the whore. I wrote this play to give young women more options, more choices. And I want this play to be developed and produced across Connecticut colleges first over the next two years. With your support today, it can be. How do our belief systems shape our identities, choices, and sense of belonging? Who are you today? Says who? Thank you so much for that presentation, Morella. Um, I'd like to turn it over to our judges now, if any of them have questions about Friend Animals or the production plan. You can also just hang out for a couple minutes. OK, no questions. Uh, great. Thank you so much, Morella. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Next up, we have another venture. Angel DeFay is going to um, present Sweets and Sounds Entertainment. Hi. I'm sorry, give me one second.
these have all felt very strong to me so far. I don't envy our judges. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, guys. Hi. My name is Angel DeFay. I am the creator and founder of Sweets and Sounds Entertainment. We are a company dedicated to celebrating and centering BIPOC creators by combining food, music, design, and art to create one-of-a-kind experiences. And we do that through online content and in-person events. What was my inspiration? My inspiration for creating Sweets and Sounds Entertainment was the countless talented BIPOC artists in CT that were lacking funds, opportunities, and support that they needed for them to be able to grow in the career field that they chose. Sweets and Sounds Entertainment is divided into four different pillars, right? So we have Sweets and Sounds Convention, which is focused on the professional advancement of the creatives of color in CT. We have a jubilation, which is focused on highlighting black businesses. And then we have the playground, which is a series of nightlife activations. And then last but not least, we have Sweet Talk, which is a one-on-one -on -one conversation series that highlights and spotlights the creators in CT. So a deeper dive into each of these pillars. The first one is the convention, right? At the convention, we have panel discussions composed of experts. We have installations. We have workshops with local partners, such as the New Haven Art Council, where we showcase the creators of CT, how to build your own website, how to establish your own business, how to apply for funding, what's a fiscal sponsor, like so many knowledgeable things that we normally don't know until we figure it out on our own or we know someone that does. A deeper dive into the next one, which is jubilation. Jubilation is where we take our love for food and music and combine it together. We um, jubilation includes live musical performances, a three-course meal, a wine sommelier experience, as well as black vendors being able to showcase their work. Um, the primary, the primary spotlight for jubilation is to create a networking environment for people to come together and meet the people who are in their community and grow and just make that connection. Third pillar, again, is the playground. And at the playground, we have DJ battles, vendors, installations, again. Our goal for the playground is to enhance the nightlife culture in CT. Um, so a lot of people don't have to drive up to New York. You can just stay here. We have cool things. We have cool clubs. We have cool vendors, DJs, and cool experiences for you to be able to stay in CT, which is a primary thing for what Sweets and Sounds does. And then last but not least, we have Sweet Talk, which is a live interview with the creators in the community. This format gives us the opportunity to highlight the creators and gain a knowledgeable, um, or gain the knowledge that they've been through and their experience for them to be able to share with everyone as well. So the power of arts and why the arts is important, right? At Sweets and Sounds, we believe in harnessing the potential of art, music, design, and food. We have witnessed firsthand how these sensory experiences can boost the blossoming arts industry in Connecticut that is slowly developing and coming together. What's next for Season Sounds? As we move forward, we envision in expanding our reach and our impact. Our next steps involve collaborating with like-minded partners, investors, and exploring new avenues for the growth and to continue the artists, and specifically the BIPOC artists in CT. Join us. Um, we invite you to join us on this journey to make a difference in the arts community. You can learn more about us at our website, which is sweetsandsounds.com, and you can follow us on Instagram at sweetsandsounds underscore. Um, and yeah, my name is Angel, and I'm the creator of Sweets and Sounds again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Angel, with Sweets and Sounds judges. Thank you so much. Um, I definitely want to go to one of those dinners. So. Uh, just can you give some sort of top line on your financial model and are you self-sustaining right now? And then secondly, you mentioned something that 
online and in person. It seems like a lot of this is in person. So if you could mm -hmm. speak to that as well, that'd be great. Yeah. So um, right now, the funding comes from in pocket as well as grants. Um, those are the two ways that we get funding, which is from the grants and from the money that we make from the events that we have, as well as money that comes from my pocket as well. Um, and in terms to the online content, um, going back to Sweet Talk. So Sweet Talk, Sweet Talk is a live showcase, but we also showcase that on YouTube and social media as well. So um, that's something that we do that's online. Another way for the online is just being able to um, do social media, the marketing, and all those other aspects of the show. Thanks. Thank you. Can you speak to um, the conference that you had and the feedback you received from artists where you were giving that knowledge to them and how impactful it could be or is? Yeah, so for me, I created the conference from experience, right? I'm a black creative in CT, and a lot of the things that I learned, I had to figure it out on my own. I didn't have the opportunity. I didn't have the support. I didn't have the funds. So a lot of the feedback I get from the people from um, the conference, they're like, one, they're in spaces with the creatives that look like them that are also going through the things that they've been going through. And then also they're being able to connect with people who know value and can be able to teach them and show them how to be a better business person or better entrepreneur, or however. So a lot of the feedback I get is like, wow, I didn't know that there was such a thing as a fiscal sponsor. Like, I didn't know I can apply as a fiscal sponsor with a company that's a nonprofit, and I can use them to be able to, like, do other things. Sorry. <laughs> but, um, but, yeah, so it's just a lot of feedback specifically for the conference on the growth and the things that they need to be able to be um, the best version of themselves that they can be and be able to succeed. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Angel. Thank you. All right, our penultimate pitch today uh, will sound familiar to you if you left the Arts Showcase last night humming a tune. Um, I am now going to introduce our next presenters, Kathleen Wren and Peter Hodgson, who are going to introduce you to The Bridge. <laughs> Clicker. This is forward. Hold on, give me okay. one second. Oh, there it is. That looks like us. <laughs> Hi. Hello, and welcome to our pitch for The Bridge, a new musical epic. My name is Kathleen Rin, and I wrote the book and lyrics. And my name is Peter Hodgson, and I wrote the music. The musical theater industry today is limited by either or thinking. There is a common misconception that musicals have to choose. They can either have commercial appeal, normally associated with tourist ticket sales, or they can have artistic integrity, attracting New York theater goers. However, our musical bridges the divide. And what's more, the top grossing Broadway musicals are also those who have managed to bridge these two markets. A little bit about our show. Inspired by true events, The Bridge is a new musical epic that tells the story of the woman who secretly built the Brooklyn Bridge. When Emily Roebling's husband falls mysteriously ill and is unable to continue as chief engineer, Emily must take up the reins in an era half a century before women were allowed to vote. Set in the fractured wake of the American Civil War, this large cast, big canvas, bold spectacle book musical... Can you tell she's the writer? Exp <laughs> ...explores the forces that unite and divide us, shining a light on those whose lives and contributions have historically been left in the shadows. So like we said... The top grossing Broadway musicals of all time have achieved both commercial success and artistic impact. And they did that by combining three main ingredients. Hook, or what gets the audience in the seats. The untold story of the Wicked Witch of the West. <laughs> the mysterious ghost in a Paris opera house. American history, but now with hip hop. <laughs> For us, the woman behind an iconic New York City landmark. Heart, or what moves them during the show. The friendship between Elphaba and Glinda, the love triangle between Raoul, Christine, and the Phantom, Hamilton's meteoric rise and untimely death. For us, the Roebling's tragic love story, and Scope, or what they buzz about after they leave. Elphaba flew, a chandelier fell, Hamilton beat Thomas Jefferson in a rap battle. <laughs> and we're building the Brooklyn Bridge on stage. 
Getting to the numbers, musicals profit from a variety of revenue streams, both in the near and long term, from traditional sources like ticket sales, cast album rights and sales, merchandising, licensing, touring, and now, more than ever before, rights for film and television adaptations. For example, recently we saw Tick, Tick, Boom be released on Netflix. Uh, Hamilton was on Disney+. Plus. In the Heights and West Side Story were both on HBO Max, not to mention live televised musicals on ABC, NBC, Fox. And when all the ingredients combine to make a hit, they result in an enormous return on investment. These are the top five highest grossing Broadway musicals of all time. In the bottom row, you can also see what their IP has grossed worldwide. And yes, Phantom had $6 billion, or 750 times its initial investment of $8 million in 1988, all the way up to Hamilton in 2015, which... Uh, has already made over a billion dollars in eight years and is still going real strong. <laughs> so for the bridge to follow in their footsteps, what does that look like? We're already well on our way. Having completed a workshop of the first full draft, followed by further artistic and business model development in the Midnight Oil Collective Incubator. And this summer, after taking on MOC Spark funding, we will be securing producing partners, which will then allow us to move forward to a staged reading, pre-production workshop, regional premiere, and finally, a Broadway transfer. The bridge has already had many successes, including being in the final rounds of highly sought after competitions like the O'Neill National Music Theater Conference right here in Connecticut and the San Diego State University New Musical Initiative. We've also received developmental opportunities and awards from Midnight Oil Collective, the Catwalk Art Institute, Syracuse University's Premier Drama Program, and our songs have been featured at acclaimed New York City institutions such as 54 Below and New York Theater Barn. So what's next? Well, that depends on you here. In the fall, we will be producing a staged reading as our proof of concept for the bridge, either in Brooklyn or right here in New Haven. MOC intends to invest $30,000 in our franchise, and we're seeking a producing partner or partners to match that investment. That is the one ingredient we're still missing. Because, like we said, we already have everything else we need. Hook, heart, scope. And the fourth and final ingredient of any Broadway hit, great music. Chills, I love musicals. <laughs> um, all right, judges, do we have any questions for the Rin and Hodgson team? We can also just live in that moment if you want. <laughs> <laughs> all right, no questions? Great. Thank you so right. much. Thank so you so much. <laughs> all right, and our final venture is going to be Creative Evolutions. The folks introducing that are Kalita Jones and Doug Clayton. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's right. Yep. Um, those were amazing. Sorry, I know I'm probably cheating, but those were amazing. <laughs> so thank you to all the other innovative pitches that just happened. One out of two, two out of two, excellent. Thank you. And your button is right there. Here. Yeah, the big button. Excellent. Go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um, all of those pitches were amazing, and they need really healthy, sustainable, business innovative models. The current models that are in, in place don't work. They won't work for the projects that just got presented. They won't have the support. They won't have the infrastructure. They won't have the people from the community that they're literally pouring into to create an economy that's prosperous. Um, I'm Kalita Jones, and I am one of the co-founders of Creative Evolutions, and we are those people who are blowing up the current business models. 
We want to see something different. We want to see this room, actually. We want to see what's reflective of Connecticut, what's reflective of the world, and it looks vastly different than who's in leadership currently. So it's our job and it's our collective responsibility to activate, disrupt, agitate, and reset the table. Thanks, Kalita. Uh, I'm Doug Clayton. I'm a co-founder, co-managing collaborator with Creative Evolutions with Kalita. So just like Midnight Oil Collaborative has incredibly well demonstrated to you all this weekend, or this week, these two days, wherever we are, um, that's one great new model for how these things can work. We need a whole lot more of those. So Kalita and I are both artists our entire lives. Kalita is a violinist by trade and has also done lots of things in music education. I've been in theater, I've run opera companies, I've done literature, I've been a playwright, I do ballroom dance. So we are both like artists to our core and also very interested in how all of this works together. I have multiple business degrees. Kalita works in government. We have seen our entire lives how incredibly talented people are not re realizing their full potential because the business models and structures don't support them to do so. And remember, organizations exist so that people can reach their potential, not the other way around. So first, business innovation in arts and culture is stuck. And it's been stuck for our entire lives. We have so many colleagues who are retiring right now. And when I ask them, what's your biggest regret? They say, we've been doing things exactly the same way since 1980. The nonprofit model, to talk about nonprofits for a second, was only invented in 1963. That's one full career's worth of time to now. And it's about time for us to really look at that and say, does this work or does this not work? So that's where we are at this moment. And we have so many people working so hard. Many of you in this room identify with some of those labels up there, activists, managers, researchers. But there is what's missing is a real research and development technology lab for business models for how arts and culture can work. And that's what we're here to provide in collaboration with all of our friends here at Yale. Great, so the market values has changed, values have changed, we are censoring values, we're encouraging others in the field to censor values and actually censor people over profit and censor relationships, transformative relationships, not transactional, which is a lot of the work that we end up doing when we're looking for funding. We have to make friends with people that have the money and try to earn the right to get money to do really good work to support the communities we say we care about. How can you care when you're chasing money? So it's really about understanding the market, it's really about prioritizing racial justice, which obviously Obviously, you know, the last three years we were doing that. Don't know what happened, but hopefully we can walk back into that moment. Um, and we do that on purpose with intentionality, which is super important. And then the cost for materials and labor and the people, the team. The team is what we need. That is our that is our big thing. We need the team, and we want to uplift people who are interested in agitating the current systems and demanding change, and then doing it real time. Right, and that doing it is really the thing. We were just at another conference, which will remain anonymous for this moment, but there was a research panel and all these researchers got up and said, it's all changed. Communities have changed, values have changed, audiences have changed. You managers, go change your business model. And 300 arts managers went cold as ice. And we're like, we don't know how to do that. Why do you think we know how to do that? And the researchers said, well, we don't know how to do it. And that is, again, the space that we're stepping into right now. So. We were really inspired um, by actually a board member of a major arts institution a couple years ago came to us um, different, separately and said, where's the store? Where is the store for new ideas and models and solutions? Because I've been on boards of all sorts of different arts organizations. I've been a commercial producer on things. And everybody kind of tells me there's one way to do stuff. He's like, but obviously this doesn't work most of the time. So where's the store? I want to go into a store. I want to say, I need revenue models for a $5 million theater company that's really engaged with its South Asian East, uh, Southeast Asian community in California. And I want the clerk to say that's aisle four. And I want to go there and see 25 different things that have been all thought out by experts and people who know what they're talking about, some of which are bestsellers that are used all over the country, some of which are niche products that only a few companies maybe have used or a few artists have made work and some that are brand new hot off the presses nobody's ever tried it but maybe you're the one who should try it and then I want to call the geek squad the consultants to say okay come now adapt this for me specifically for my community for my artists and so that's what creative evolutions is about is about centering the space to create new solutions and then having a consulting arm and a coaching arm um, as well, but also lifting up the innovations that you all have already created and no one knows about. So that's the other piece there.
Sure. All right. Thank you so much, Kalita and Douglas, for uh, introducing us to Creative Evolutions. Sure. Do our judges have any questions for the team? We're sneaking by putting up the what last slide so that people can see. What do you need to make that happen? Yeah, for sure. So we've already just been, the biggest thing, and Kalita says this all the time, so I'm stealing this from you, okay. is just to be able to say, let's do it. So as just an example, we were asked right as we started, is there a different way to do hiring? Right? We're like, sure there is. There's lots of different ways. Let's start with no board search committees. Let's not do that. Let's pay people for their time as candidates to come in. And people went, can we do that? We said, yeah, we can do it right now. And then we start sharing out these ideas. And it's amazing how quickly organizations and individuals and funders and universities have already, in a couple of months, just been jumping all over it just to say, great, ooh, like I want more choices. I want more options. So what we need in terms of activating this further is really we're building out a team of folks. And we are also mainly looking for partners and funding to activate the think tank sessions that are needed. We have universities already lined up saying, we'll host something if you bring the right people here to think. But it's requiring a whole different business model, which we can talk about for sure um, later, that, um, that is putting, prioritizing rewarding the people who create the value. So there's all sorts of amazing thinkers out here who've come up with all sorts of different ways to do things, but they say, I'm not gonna come help you or work with you if you're gonna take my stuff. If you're gonna say, come give me all your ideas and then I'm gonna take it and own it and you're out. Or I'm gonna pay you, like we were talking about earlier with some uh, filmmakers, I'm gonna pay you $1,000 now and then I'm gonna take all the future of this. That's not, uh... so those are the things we need. Kalita. Great. Any, you can add a final. Oh, yep. sorry. I can? Okay. I'm talking <laughs> no, 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 no. It's totally no. fine. So um, we need space. We need time. We need to pause. I think something we always forget is we have plenty of time. And we really need to deactivate the sense of urgency that lives within all arts and culture organizations in this country. Like, decenter it, destroy it, dismantle it. Pause, think, process, breathe. And stop trampling over people to get to the next step. Take space, relax, chill and then come back with an open heart and open mind and agitate and disrupt. That, that's literally all I do. That's all I, I just light fires and I walk. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, what an inspiring note to end on. That was amazing. Uh, thank you all. Can we um, just give a round of applause to all of our pitchers? That was an incredible lineup. Amazing. All right, our judges are going to secretly, privately deliberate now, and um, everyone else, I believe you're released for um, the awards show. It's coming up next. Thank you all. in there and get a cute selfie. A cute selfie? Oh, yes. <laughs> with the rest of Yeah, them. yeah, yeah. Because, like, I'm Sarah with the Arts Council, so yes. I get your email all the time, and everyone mixes us up all the time. That's Because right. I'm Sarah Fika. Yes, and you, yeah, I'm so Sarah I'm like, okay, Fika. not all of us Sarahs are the same, right? Um, but anyway, I thought that was funny. Um, you don't want to get a selfie with them? Oh, that's okay. Um, yeah, they, I, they actually have to look quickly. I like really decided like for the awards ceremony. Yeah, because that was due um, like half an hour ago. And but so as a lifelong New Haven resident and townie, mm -hmm. I would like to say that I have never seen so much positive outreach from Yale in trying to interact with New Haven. And I know that there's always more that can be done. But like compared to the 90s and the way those of us outside of Yale were treated, this is like sea change. You know, like, yeah, more can be done, but uh, just even just the fact that you all reach out to the Arts Council and tell us to promote events to our members. Yeah. Even just that basic step that, like, back in the 90s, even when I would find out about a free Yale event, there was kind of this wall. Like, who are you? What are you doing here? Oh, even for well, me as a town. That is great to hear from so. someone who, like, has, has been here and has seen that change. Yeah, I, it feels like...
for the second nature like that we want to bring the community in. I mean, I'm not really real affiliated no, at all. It, was, <laughs> it wasn't like that at all. Like in the 90s, I remember like going up to Harvard and being like, why are there all these advertisements all over town for free events at Harvard? I don't see this at Yale. So just, you know, always more to be done, but that is a 20 year change that I see, you know, pretty, pretty good. That's, so. good. That's good to hear. It's definitely like something I'll keep note of that is like yeah. positive and contributing. In yeah, because you know, you hear the negative all the time, and yes, of course, you could do better and you could do more. But like, build on that, keep going with it. So. Well, thank you for saying that as much. And, yeah. Um, we'll yeah. see you at the award ceremony. Yeah, so, I'll be there. I love your blazer, so. like tape thing. Yeah. It's thick. <laughs> I want my art too. Yeah. Kind of. <laughs> yeah. And I, you know, midnight oil. Like I've never seen so like so much. Um, like I was talking to Maurice. Like, about how he can be his authentic artistic self at his Yale job. Like, those of us who worked at Yale, I worked many different temp Yale jobs during my time, hid who we were as artists in order to work the day job at Yale and collect the money to live. And just seeing that interaction and people being able to be their authentic selves at work is also new and different and innovative. That's so. great. That's the goal. Like, that's really yeah, no, I used to hide my music career while I was doing the Yale answering the phones. Oh, so. it feels like that should go. Yeah, I mean, I hope it's it's yeah. Nice, nice to meet you. Good luck running the rest of your conference. <laughs> I'm going yep. to check because I'm sure a lot of people just came from this and are going. In. Yep, yep. Thank you so much. Everyone will be in
it's, you know, I think when you bring a group of people together and you just say, we want to talk about it, we just talk about it in a different way. And I think when you bring in all of these creative books together and you say, hey, cool, it's not really about this. Let's, 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 let's apply creativity to the business model as well. I said that to somebody. Yeah, that you were standing outside, so you were like, I'm really mad. You were looking at all these things. And then you had to see it. I'm going to see it faster. Well, that guy kind of sucks. You know? No. <laughs> I, I'm coming back here because you don't know this, but maybe we could talk before the end of June. I am headlining Calpers. Oh. Annual conference. Oh, oh, so oh, yeah. yeah. And the intention all. Yeah. They want me to come yeah. with investors. Yeah. Absolutely. First, yeah. 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 Yeah.
uh, tomorrow morning, and it's starting. So I'm like, I want to, I got to meet Jeremy, I want to either bypass UTA, but I've turned the book into a... The script, that's to me, I reached out to Matt. I want to talk with you about that. I have, a, I have a very personal connection with UTA right now, and they're driving me batty. And so I wanted to tell you about that. Yeah, yeah. yeah everyone is annoying, other than Jer Jeremy. Yeah. yeah, I think even people who are like lovely people who want to do well are just so interested in game. It's, a, it's a addictive, like it's like it spit you out, spit you out. And then the musical part, you know, you know I met with Diane and then and we met. His partner's great. So, um, you know, and so like this is... That's the thing that I'm doing. Yeah. 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 No, no, totally. No, that's so done. It's the obvious. Yeah. 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 I have this whole robust connection to all of these. This is what I was telling you. It's like when I was thinking about all of the people I could introduce you to. I mean, who I have to You know, I'm a world class composer. Yeah. You know? So what Diane said, so Diane Paul is like, when we spoke, she said, I see it, we see it. She brought in her creative directors. But she said, and she's right, you're gonna, she's like, you're, you're gonna have to disrupt the musical because the community has won the first time ever after 14, 15 years. And then I just said, yeah, what I'm good at, like, I need, I need an expert to do this, but connecting the genres. Yeah. And she's like, that it would be new. I'm like, well, that should happen. Yeah. Everyone should get credits. Everyone should. That's and, and honestly, like, you're going to control your IP so much more than, so much better than, yeah. like, these traditional channels. And I want the composer to get it. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And so she's, she's just like, let me. Yeah. Well, let's have a conversation with her too. I've, I've gotten a lot of people who are like, I think you need to talk to my CEO. I think you need to talk to my general director. I think you need, because like, they're hearing all of this and they're like, oh, we've been so bottlenecked that like, we can't see daylight anymore. And like, this is a way that you, that we could start to reimagine how we do things. You know, so like, let's have that lunch and like, let's talk it out about that to see what it's going to I mean, I think you're better off coming with me to meet Judith Kerr. Okay. So Judith is the, that's the Viola Dick, she's the star. Yeah. So now, now they're convinced, now they've read the book and they're like, oh, it's a, it literally is a piece of music. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. I told you, like, it is a piece of music. So they're like, oh, we you understand. So, yeah. I was also very impressed with the, uh, yeah.